Okay. So this the second part of today is um, a kind of a short recap uh, on uh, how to deal with uh, the hardware part uh, and uh, some basic do-it-yourself uh, procedure uh, so that uh, you should be at least uh, able to, to grasp how to, to start uh, the design of a, of a custom component uh, and to how to interface it using the Raspberry Pi. So this is not meant for uh, uh, a complete course on uh, electronics development or design because we, we do not have time nor the skills. So the idea is just to provide you an hint on, uh, on the hardware platform on which we are going to work and on how to develop some very simple circuit, okay? And if you have any question, just tell me at every time. So uh, starting from hardware, uh, because we are trying to uh, tackle the hardware part today. Uh, we are basically treating three types of hardware in our course. Uh, where the first one is uh, composed by commercial off-the-shelf components. So we have plugs, we have actuators, we have uh, gateways. Um, well, this part uh, is already available for use and typically does not involve any development, any design at the electronic level, at the hardware level. We just use them. The other part is uh, related to uh, what isn't available on the market or what uh, we cannot afford to buy. In that case, we may want to try developing something by ourselves. In that case, uh, we usually speak of do-it-yourself solution because actually, uh, at least in this course, we cannot go beyond do-it-yourself. Uh, we, we don't have the, the capabilities nor the time for developing at the, the professional level. So what we do is, is just uh, something like do it yourself. And the latest part, uh, the latest kind of hardware uh, with which uh, we deal in this course is, of course, the gateway. So you, we already know that it's the PI, okay? So we need to uh, know the gateway, um, understand how it works, uh, know what are the, the gateway capabilities, what we can expect from our gateway, what we can uh, implement on the gateway, and uh, on the other hand, what we cannot implement on the gateway. Okay, so it's really, really important uh, when we are starting to design some new feature because maybe we need some computation that cannot be carried, for example, on the board. If we need to mine uh, 200 billion data for understanding uh, what the user is doing in the home, we cannot do that on the Raspberry Pi. We must do it offline and then we may develop some rules or something that can uh, be run on the PI because it's uh, a more lightweight. Okay. So that's more or less the three types of hardware uh, with which uh, um, we try to tackle the MEI part. And uh, the focus of today is uh, on understanding the gateway, so understanding what are the, the capabilities of our uh, uh, hardware gateway, and to start uh, providing some very, very simple uh, do-it-yourself solution, okay? So we, we have here uh, a breadboard connected to the PI, and we will see uh, what can we do by wiring the PI to some uh, small device. Um, what about the rest? What about the, the commercial devices and so on? Uh, we don't speak of them today, basically because we will speak of them throughout the course. So in the next lessons, you will get a, a detailed view on what are the available protocols, uh, what are the, the features, uh, the pros and the cons. Uh, and that's why we don't focus in this lesson about the commercial part, because uh, it's the part which is more, uh, which gets more focus in the course with respect to the other part. Let's see. And what's the goal of today? Uh, I said we don't want to uh, learn how to design or how to develop electronics, uh, nor we don't want uh, to uh, learn how to build a new PI or a new uh, embedded board. What we want to achieve is to know our reference platform. So we, we try to get some knowledge about it, uh, some SIG knowledge on, upon which you can start building, okay? And on the other hand, we want to, be, to get started a little, at least, 
own building do it yourself solution so that if you need to build something for your projects you can do it or at least you can you know from which from where to start okay what are the, the documents to read what are the the, the knowledge bases to exploit and so on so so don't, don't expect too much of today, uh, rather than having some void, uh, some idea on how the possibilities. So let's start uh, with the kind of design approach. We already know that we will use the Raspberry Pi, but why? Why we, we decided to use it uh, uh, with respect to other available platform, for example? We tried to go a step back and to understand why it was uh, selected among the available choices. So what are the features that the gateway must have for effectively take the intelligence in the environment? It should be able to host the intelligence. So it, it should provide some computational power, in a sense. Uh, it should be easy to interface with the existing uh, automation systems, with existing devices, with existing appliances. So if I want to interf interface my smart TV, I should be able to communicate with it. As well, I'm, I need to communicate, for example, f uh, with my home automation system based on Zigbee or uh, with uh, my uh, uh, solar panels, uh, which speak uh, Modbus, for example, or other protocols. So I need some, something, some hardware which is able to, uh, which can be easily connected to different devices and different protocols. And of course, since the hardware shouldn't be isolated because maybe we want to integrate some feature coming from outside, from the internet, for example. We want to exploit the uh, uh, weather forecast, for example. Or we want to connect uh, our home uh, to some remote server so that we can control it from remote, for example. Or we want uh, maybe to implement some policy for activating different devices depending on our distance from home, and so on. Uh, the same gateway should have ways for connecting to the internet. It depends, of course, on the hardware. It might be just an internet connection, which is directly uh, plugged into the home network, or maybe a GPRS connection, which stands alone. It depends. But we need somewhat uh, the ability to connect to the internet. Um, and another desirable feature, at least for our course, for, for the designing part, uh, it's the ability of the gateway to interface, to integrate uh, some ad hoc solution. Because maybe we want to realize some specific feature on the environment uh, which cannot be done by using simple commercial things. Okay. In that case, we need a kind of development platform, something that can support also this part. And going back, we can analyze what are the candidates. So we have this set of features. Which platforms? are available on the market, are already available, that can support in some way these features. At least there are three main uh, big platforms, one of which is the PI, okay, but the other is the big old blackboard and the Arduino, okay. Uh, what are the differences, uh, what are the commonalities? The big old black, uh, it's quite similar to the PI, uh, both from the shape uh, and the form factor size to the the computational uh, side. Uh, the main difference is that, that the Beagle Bunny is a little bit uh, more costly than the PI. It costs around uh, $48, whereas the PI costs around $25, $30, okay? Um, it is typically more powerful from the computational point of view, okay? But it's a little bit easy, a uh, little bit uh, less easy to interface with other uh, technologies and protocols, because basically there are a uh, few shields with respect to uh, the one available, for example, for Arduino or for the PI. So we get um, a powerful platform, but it, it's a little bit less easy to interface with other devices in the home. Uh, it has a good connectivity. Basically, it has uh, an, Ethernet, an Ethernet port uh, built in, plus uh, some USB port and so on. So we can build whatever we, uh, we want about connectivity, basically. So no problem about that. So the main, the main reason for not choosing it is the cost on one side, and uh, is uh, the difficulty on interfacing other devices, uh, commercial devices, let's say, uh, on the other side. 
I'm saying commercial and not do it yourself because actually the Beagle board, the Beagle board supports very well uh, do it yourself, the do it yourself part, even a little better than, uh, than the PI. Okay, but the idea is that it's a good candidate if we can afford spending forty-five dollars. Uh, on the other hand, we have the Arduino part. Arduino is, let's say, the, the standard de facto for uh, um, working uh, on do-it-yourself project and on low-level control projects. It has a, a really, really strong history of uh, project, hardware projects and can take all, almost everything. You, you have a huge base of knowledge uh, uh, and a huge base of people using the Arduino board and proposing projects and solutions. But the problem is that it is uh, n not really high computational power. It is basically a microcontroller. So we cannot run on it, for example, the, the Java framework or Python. Um, and typically, it has low connectivity. So it doesn't have built-in Ethernet ports or uh, uh, wireless module and so on. It is basically a very simple circuit, in a sense, from, uh, from the, the, the point of view of connectivity. Um, and it is more tailored for hardware control rather than uh, for general purpose computing. Uh, the advantage with respect to the others is that it costs uh, um, an order of magnitude less than uh, the Beagle board or the Raspberry Pi. It's around seven, ten dollars. Okay, but we can ex exploit it uh, because of its uh, uh, difficulty to communicate to, with commercial devices and to be interfaces uh, interfaced from the internet in a sense from another PC. Okay, so that's why we didn't choose it. But if we if we only needed to develop some ad hoc solution, that would be the better choice, best choice. Um, Finally, we get the Raspberry Pi, which is in between. It is not optimum from the computational point of view, uh, and not, not optimum from the hardware point of view, but it's a good trade-off. Okay? It is quite cheap, not really cheap, but quite cheap, around $30, more or less. It's easy to interface other devices, uh, especially commercial devices, because there are shields already provided for it. Okay, so we got a shield for Z-Wave devices, a shield for uh, Zigbee devices, and so on. What is a shield? A shield is basically um, an expansion board that can be plugged on the PI, okay? And which has a, a rather low cost, because if you are counting the costs, of course, the, the, the platform has its own cost, but also the shields, okay? So, for example, if you want a, a Raspberry Pi with the Z-Wave shield, you will get end up with a total cost of around eighty dollars. Okay, so it's easy; it's really easy to grow up uh, with costs, and that might not be affordable if we want to uh, fill our environments with computational devices, because we are aiming at having an intelligent device, an intelligent environment with many devices inside. So we need to consider also the, these issues when uh, when started to design. Uh, Going back to the PI, we, the, the PI offers a good connectivity because it has a, a, an Ethernet uh, port built in, at least in the type B, um, and a, a rather good computational power, nearly comparable to the big old one. Okay? So that's why we choose the PI, not because it was a kind of fate selection, but because we evaluated the requirements and that was the, bit, the best trade-off at the moment. Might be in the future, it will change, of course. So let's start with the PI. Here we have a sketch, an end sketch of the PI. Uh, and here we have a copy. So let's try to understand uh, what are the components of the PI. Then we will look at that on the real board, OK? But let me just uh, first speak in on, on the slide and then switching so that it's easier to understand. There are several components. The central one is the processor, of course, the one which performs computation. How, how strong is the processor? How, how far we can go with computation? Basically, as far as we can go with the iPhone 3G, because it's the same processor, more or less. Okay. So this is a comparison which is not techni technical, but just to give you an idea of the power we can exploit. Uh, 
going more, te in a more technical detail, what we have as a processor is an ARM 11 processor at 700 megahertz and 32 bits. And the board is already uh, available 512 megabytes of RAM in the Type B version, which is the one we will go, uh, we will use in the course. Okay, so it's rather powerful board. Uh, we can do almost all tasks with that. Um, the particularity of the Raspberry is that it has no hard disk. Why it has no hard disk drive? Because basically Basically, it consumes a lot, it is costly, it, uh, it takes space, okay? And this is a, a, a board designed for being embedding, embedded in a sense, for being used directly on the field in small cases and with a low power consumption. So they decided to substitute the, the hard drive with an SD card. And it's almost the same apart from one aspect, that on the SD card you can write and read, especially write, only a limited times, amount of times, okay? It's rather high, but it's fixed and limited. So care should be taken when creating software or uh, configuring your gateway to avoid uh, frequent writes and frequent and repetitive writes. So for example, if you are using a Linux-based system, it's not a good idea to have a swap part on the, on the SD card, because the swap is used for um, temporarily storing files that should be in memory usually, okay? So it will be written very frequently by the system. And this will rapidly wear down the SD card and make it unusable. Okay, so that, that's a, a downside of, the, of this design choice. Other hardware that we have on board, uh, there are two USB ports. USB 2, um, they are standard, so they support up to 500 million pairs of power supply, but please be aware that they are not designed uh, for deriving, for uh, consuming high power. So they are not designed, for example, for charging your uh, cellular phones or your, lap or your uh, tablets and so on, okay? You can try it, but if you get with the board burnt, <laughs> M might be not a good result, okay? Because the board is not designed to be a computer, to be something that has power inside and then can, and then can power other devices, okay? So the, the maximum ratings are respected, but it, care should be uh, taken when handling the device itself. Um, I'm speaking of you of these hardware details because these are the details we must consider when developing hardware projects. That's why I'm trying to, to push uh, these aspects uh, even in this first uh, uh, description phase. Um, other things that are on board and that we can exploit, it's an internet connection, wired connection, uh, 10, 100 auto settings, so uh, it depends on the network uh, with which you connect to. Um, and it can use Wi-Fi connectivity uh, by means of a USB dongle. So we have two USB ports. If you want Wi-Fi, one is lost for Wi-Fi. Okay, so just one USB port. Other uh, parts of the API, uh, it offers an HDMI um, video output. Okay, so it can be connected with uh, any HDMI uh, output like uh, TV, uh, a monitor, or whatever. A projector also, okay. No other connector apart from uh, a PAL and TSG uh, connector, which is the composite video out. So if you want to connect a simple uh, VGA monitor, VGA monitor, you need to get an adapter. But the idea is that uh, there are many adapters for HD, from HDMI to whatever, and that's why they selected HDMI. Um, <coughs> Why do we need to know this? Because in the first part, in the first installation of the DPI, probably you will get, you will need the monitor, okay? And therefore you will need an HDMI monitor, or at least an adapter. Um, then it is on board some status LEDs, 
um, which basically provide feedback on the current status of the, of the board, which means uh, is the board powered or not? Is the SD card recognized or not? Is it working or not? Uh, is the link, the Ethernet link connected or not? And uh, there is activity on the Ethernet or not? So some uh, feedback information. Um, then we can also exploit some audio output. Uh, it is a standard jack, uh, small jack, uh, 3.5 millimeters. But this jack is not designed for driving uh, low impedance loads like uh, uh, earphones, for example. Uh, it is mainly designed for driving high impedance outputs like um, active speakers and so on. Okay, so if you try to charge it, probably you will get at least if you charge it too much, you get part of the chip burned, probably. Okay, so care must be taken also on this side. Um, power, okay. I'm pushing to you warning about warnings on power consumption and so on. OK. Uh, how it is powered? This board is powered to USB, to micro USB. And it takes uh, around 700 milliamperes. Usually, the power supply which comes with the PI provides up to uh, 1.2 amperes. OK, so it has plenty of power for supporting the PI plus some other add-on circuit. OK. In principle, you can provide power to the PI from a USB port on your PC. But I'm saying in principle because actually the PI is going to draw more current than the maximum allowed. It's like, a, I don't know if you have uh, in mind the hard drive, external hard drives that have at least two USB uh, cables, one for powering and the other for the data. That's because the hard drive is consuming more than 500 milliamperes, which is the maximum rating. The same should be done with the PI, okay? But unfortunately, we have just one power plug. So that's why I'm saying you can plug it. Actually, it works most of the time, but you are drawing too much current from your PC. So if you are using, for example, a laptop, maybe uh, after a long time, you get also the USB port of your PC burned. OK? So care on the current every time. Um, nearly at the end, other components on board are uh, the general purpose input output. This is uh, the most important part for the do-it-yourself section of our course, in a sense, because uh, it provides an header with some pin on it. And every pin can be used for reading or writing digital signals. Okay. This means that by writing the proper software, for example, in Python, which is one of the languages supported by the PI, you can actually drive some real device or, or read some real values from the uh, external devices through this header. Uh, typically, they are used either to read some input or to control some actuator, maybe with some power section in between, because we already know that actually uh, the board by itself cannot drive much power. Okay, So we cannot drive a, a lamp using the GPIO pin. We, we may drive some driver. So some power circuit able to drive the lamp. Um, and finally, there are two serial interfaces, one for having a, a display, so you can attach a display on the, on the board and transform it, for example, into a media center or uh, into a, an internet radio. And you have also a camera serial interface, uh, which allows uh, uh, to plug a special camera on the PI, uh, for example, to implement some devices which exploit the vision for performing tasks. You can imagine there are projects, uh, actually, on the internet uh, where you plug a camera on the PI and use the camera to detect if someone is looking at an object. And if the object feels the attention of the user, does something. For example, a lamp that feels that the user is looking at the lamp lights up. OK? Examples. 
OK. Uh, let's try to switch a, a second on, uh, on the other part so that we can have a look at the board and identify what are the costs. OK. You have the PI here, OK? The central uh, black square uh, is the processor. Uh, it is not advisable to touch it because it becomes a little bit hot when working. Uh, you must be aware that actually every electronic device, uh, when works, uh, uh, may uh, arrive at 50, 60 degrees, Celsius degrees, and it's absolutely normal, but 60 degrees uh, already feels very, very hot on the skin, okay? So if you touch it, please be aware. Um, here you got the Ethernet port, two USB port, one stacked over the other, okay? Uh, the HDMI port is here, and these are the two serial connections. You see this one and this one for the camera and the other for the display, okay? Here you find a micro USB, which is the power supply, okay? And here you got the audio output and the video composite out. Here, under this flat cable, there are the GPIO headers, so the pins to which we can connect external devices. For example, here we have some components which are connected to the PI through this cable, okay? And this white uh, component with uh, all these thin holes is called the breadboard, okay? Upon which you can build your own circuits for testing. Okay, so this just to have a, a general overview. Um, what we still need to learn about the PI is how to deal uh, with the current drawing. I was pushing very much attention on, on, on the current because actually the problem is that if we draw too much power, we destroy our board. So whenever we start developing uh, a new hardware, a new element to connect to the PI, we need to take care of these maximum ratings, okay? So, what are the maximum ratings? They are actually difficult to find on the internet. You, can, you, uh, you have some reference on, the web, on our website. You can uh, surf the internet for finding information, but actually uh, the PI Foundation is a little bit obscure on this part. There are no specific um, ratings. These are basically collected throughout all the, the tutorials and so on. So when you start dealing with an hardware project using the PI, more or less uh, you will have to face uh, these uh, uh, limitations. So uh, you will have a power supply must be five volts, continuous, and you need at least 700 milliampers. Okay. If you use the, the normal power supply, no problem. If you attach another power supply, take care of providing at least 700 milliampers. Then, let's go on the right side. For the G GPIO, which is the one we probably use if we need to develop something ad hoc. Uh, this is really, really important because uh, the power is really, really low. Um, we can sync, so we can draw from the board at maximum 16 milliampere per each pin, okay? Very, very few. It compared, for example, to the maximum rating of a USB port, which is 500. And when we try to drive an external device, so to provide current, the syncing means that the board syncs the current from the external device. The other side is when the board provides the current. In that case, the limit is lower it is tunable from 2 to 16 milliampers, but usually it is much better if you can draw less than 1 milliampere. Okay. Overall, the entire pin set can only draw at maximum of 40 milliampers from the GPIO ports. That's why I was saying very, very low power. Okay. On the 3.3 volt, which is the uh, voltage at which the CPU is uh, powered, basically. Then you can also drive current directly from the power supply at 5 volt. In that case, you can consume 
the remaining share of the rating provided by the power supply minus the 700 million pairs uh, consumed by the board. So if the power supply is uh, 1.2 amperes, you will get 500 million pairs at your disposal. Okay? So if you need to power something like a, an LED, um, you need to get the power possibly from the 5 volts uh, power rail and not from the 3.3 volts. Okay. Um, finally, the other rating, uh, it's completely different. It's not, almost not hardware, but it's really important for us. Uh, we said that the, the board uses an SD card. Which kind of SD card? Actually, it can use almost all SD cards, but if you want to have something usable, it is advisable to use at least a class 6 SD card. Uh, the class number identifies the speed in you know, reading and writing. Okay, lower numbers, lower speed. Uh, so the, the lowest class uh, that makes the board usable is class 6. You can try with the class 4, but you will see that for any task that it's not really simple, it will get too, low, too slow for uh, any use. But typically in the lab, we will have uh, class 10 SD cards with uh, eight, 8 gigabytes of uh, size. You can go lower, but the latest releases of the OS uh, suggest to adopt at least 8 gigabytes. Okay. Operating system, um, basically Linux. Okay. Um, various versions, it depends on the preferences. Uh, there is one officially supported version, which is a Raspbian, which is a derivation of Debian. Okay, uh, which is tailored for DPI processor, basically. There is another um, distribution called Occidentalis, which is made by uh, the Adafruit company, which is a company providing uh, um, do-it-yourself kits, and is mainly targeted to uh, the electronics development. So it provides all the features needed for developing new circuits and testing them uh, with the PI. Then there are a couple of uh, other distribution coming from uh, full-fledged distribution like uh, Fedora and the corresponding port uh, is named Pidora from Raspberry Pi. Uh, Arc Linux is another one. And finally, you have some distribution aimed at transforming this uh, tiny computer into um, a media center. Because with $25, more or less, you can get a, a full-fledged media center able to stream data over the network to uh, transfer uh, your films, your movies uh, through the LNA and so on. And there are dedicated distribution for that. So that, more or less that's why the PI is uh, so diffused. It, it has so attention uh, over all the world because uh, it is quite flexible. Okay? And depending on what you install on it, uh, it can take different uh, phases, let's say. Um, there, are, there is also, uh, I think it's about three or four uh, months that it's available, uh, there's an Android port for the PI. So there is also uh, an Android 4.0 port uh, which runs on the PI, so if you want to experiment with it. Okay, um, let's go a little bit in, in deep on the installation part. So let's suppose that you bought a PI. You got it, you want to style it. Uh, we do not require you to do that because we already provide the PI installer, but maybe you want to try. Uh, for all the cores, we use the official Raspbian distribution, okay, so that it gets updated and it's optimized for the platform, but you can do whatever, use whatever distribution you want. Um, when you get Raspbian, what you get is a raw image. What means raw image? It means that this image is a file that contains the description of the SD card bit by bit. So this file cannot be just copied on the card. You cannot uh, take the folder, uh, move it on the, on the SD card, on the, on the explorer, and, and get it run. What you need to do is to copy this bit-by-bit -bit image on the SD card using a specialized program that 
If you are using Linux or uh, Mac, it's DD, that means disk to disk copy. If you are using Windows, there's a, a, a program suggested by the uh, PI Foundation, which is a Win32 disk major, that does the same. You get the file, you open the file with this program, you, set, uh, you select a write on the SD card, and that's it. At the end of the process, you get an, an SD card with on board the full file system of your distribution. Then what you do is to, let me switch. Plug the SD card here, plug the power supply, and put the plug into a wall socket, okay? There's no uh, on-off button on the PI. You just plug in the power. And the same for powering off, you just unplug the power. Okay. Once you plug the power, it starts, and since it's the first boot, usually it is advisable to plug in in the, in the PI a keyboard and a mouse through the USB ports and a monitor through the HDMI port. You can also do it headless, so without the keyboard, the mouse, and the HDMI, because the PI has already uh, activated an SSH server. SSH is a secure shell, and it's a way for communicating securely between PCs. You will see how to use the secure shell in the next fundamental, okay? If you don't know, if you already know, uh, you don't need it. But anyway, you can start it headless and directly connect it to it using another PC. But the only requirement for doing that, this is to know exactly what's the IP of the Raspberry Pi. So when you connect it, for example, to an access point, you need uh, the ability to read the access point, uh, the HCP table to understand which is the IP address, okay? That's why I was saying it is better to have the keyboard and the monitor connected because in that case, you are working directly on the board, okay? And there are projects in the world, for example, that provide these words as uh, very low cost PCs for uh, 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 countries that cannot afford PCs for education, for example. Okay, so it works perfectly. It has a graphical user interface and so on. Uh, the last thing to do when you run it up is to configure it. I don't want to enter in deep details on configuration. You can go directly on the PI website and, and everything is explained. So this is not my focus, actually. But if you have any question, then you can ask. Uh, what you get at the first run is this really, really simple welcome screen, let's say, that allows you to configure your machine, your PI, and set up some basic parameters, which are basically to expand the file system. Typically, the image uh, takes less than 8 gigabytes of memory on the S card on the SD card, and you can opt to enlarge the space in order to have some free space for working on the PI. Um, and then you can change your keyboard layout, uh, you can change your password for logging in, you can change how the memory on board is uh, split between video and normal memory. Uh, you can overclock the board if you want. There are some safe overclock frequencies, some other that may result in the in the board burning. Uh, and you can decide if this board is going to be a real PC, so it, uh, it must be started with the desktop, okay? It will be visible on the monitor. Or if you want to use this board more like a gateway, so you don't need any graphical interface because the, the gateway actually will be boxed and closed somewhere in your home, okay? And in that case, you just uh, deactivate the graphical interface, uh, freeing some memory, some resources to the other tasks on the system. Uh, the few information you need to know for starting using the PI and developing using Python are these four points. First one, how to log in. Every PI uh, using the Raspbian OS comes with a pre-installed user, which is named PI and which has a password that is uh, Raspberry, okay? 
So, of course, uh, once you connect to it, you change the password, possibly. So now, every, otherwise, everyone in the world is able to log in and do whatever he wants with your PC, with your uh, PI, sorry. Then you can also check the board revision because the specification uh, uh, which I showed you change a little bit between uh, revisions. And to get the revision, you just type on the, on the command line cat slash pro slash CPU, CPI, uh, CPU info, sorry. That provides basically the serial of the CPU running on the board. And there is a direct link between uh, the CPU on the board and the board version. Then you can check Python. Python is already installed on the PI. So you can just run Python minus minus version to get the version, which is 2.7.x. Usually it's 2.7.5, if I'm not wrong. Um, and if you want to develop using the GPIO headers, because you are working on the do-it-yourself, for example, you need to download the Python tools for working with the GPIO. For example, uh, one of the, the tools that are available are this uh, RPI GPIO. And you can do it uh, using the Python installation procedure we will, that we will see next lesson. So I don't require you to remember exactly today how to do that. But the procedure is to type easy install, the name of the module to install. Okay? So in this case, easy install, RPI GPIO. Okay? And of course, when you do that, you need to be connected with the board to the internet. So you need to get the internet access because there are some packages that need to be downloaded. Okay. Once done this process, you got your board ready and working. The next step is to decide what you do with the board. Maybe you go uh, developing just for using commercial devices. So everything is ending basically and starts the, the software design part in a sense. Or maybe you need some to develop some hardware device because they are not available or because uh, they are too costly for, uh, for being uh, buyed basically. So let's try, I, I'm not suggesting how to design nor uh, what's the process exactly, but uh, my idea here is to suggest you some three uh, projects, very simple projects, to, to get started on it. So with an hands on approach. So let's uh, start with the first project, really simple. We want to light up a LED. LED stands for light emitting diode. Um, we have a red LED, and we want to light it using the GPIO board. We want to design both the circuit and the software for lighting up the LED. Uh, what we need is, of course, the board, okay, the LED. And there I brought an NPN transistor. That's mainly because we will see we can directly drive the LED, but actually it is advisable to not draw too much current from the 3.3 volts power supply. So that's why we need a, a driver. A driver is a device that is able to be controlled by G the GPIO ports and to uh, control um, an higher amount of power, higher than the one that can be synced or sourced by the, by the PI. And the transistor is one of them. And then we will need a couple of resistors. Um, if we are required to write down a schematics, uh, it might be this. Uh, um, don't be scared. So, uh, no, we are not required to be able to design the, the, the schematics, maybe, if you want to develop some do it yourself, but not necessarily. Um, basically, the idea is that for powering a lid, we need to provide a fixed amount or a known amount of current to flow into the diode. This amount of current is usually in between 10 milliamperes and 20 milliamperes, okay? Depending on the intensity, in, this, in that range, the intensity of the LED changes, okay? So the LED becomes more, uh, more brighter or uh, less brighter, depending on the current. Um, but to draw the current, how can we regulate the current? Because, you know, the current depends on the resistance of a circuit, basically. Uh, to do that, we can, exploit uh, two reasonings. The first one is that uh, we cannot directly control the current, but we can control the current by means of a resistance. So given that we have an output voltage that we know, we can 
change the value of our resistors to power up the LED as we want. Okay? In particular, we know that um, usually a LED takes uh, as a voltage drop uh, over around 2 volts uh, when conducting. So we can compute, starting from the power supply, subtract 2 volts, uh, we get the actual power supply that, can we, use, uh, that we can use to um, drive the current we need. How? By computing the needed resistance, the value of the resistance. In our case, I already computed the values, okay? And for example, to safely drive the LED directly with the GPIO output, we can use a 330 ohm resistor, and we will see how it drives, how, um, how much current it draws from the PI. But what happens if we uh, want to employ more current because we want the light brighter, for example. We want to go nearly to 20 milliamps, which is almost the maximum. Then we are starting to um, draw in too much current from the board. Okay? In that case, we cannot directly uh, drive the LED. We need some, some circuit in between to avoid uh, sourcing out this big amount, let's say big amount of current. And that's why on the, on the right you have uh, um, this transistor here that basically acts like a switch, a controller switch, that takes uh, as input a very low amount of current, for example, some hundred microamperes, and is able to switch rather high amounts of current. This particular transistor here can work up to 500 milliamperes. So, at most, one milliampere is driving current, for example. On the other side, the uh, current that can flow through the transistor is around 500 milliamperes. That's why we need this component. OK. Um, so let's try to perform the computation and understand, for example, uh, how much current passes through the LED using 330 ohms. We know that the LED drops around 1.2, from 1.2 to 2 volts. So starting from the 3.3 volts of the direct uh, GPIO output, we get uh, 1.3 volts divided in 330 ohms. That means lowest amount of current is around 4 milliamperes. Highest is around 7, 6.30. We are in range, yes, because we said that the maximum range is 16 million. But we are already near to the limit, let's say a tough way from the limit for just a lead. If we want to pilot, for example, uh, uh, a relay or something that can switch actual power, some, some plug, for example, we cannot use directly the headers. We need something in between. Okay? What happens uh, using the transistor? Uh, we can compute the same things. We can compute the same current. In this case, since the transistor should be, should enable us to drive more current, first we decide to drop the current from the main power supply, 5 volts. Uh, we perform the same calculation. And in this case, for example, we drive nearly 10 million, 9 million pairs. Okay? This current can be driven by just sourcing up out 574 microamperes. So less of, an amp, of a million pair, basically, from the source, from the GPIO. That, in this way, can drive, for example, up to more or less 30 different outputs instead of just one. OK, so that's why we use this. OK. OK. Uh, so please forgive me for bothering you uh, with this circuits design. Let's go to the software part and then we try to use it. What about controlling this LED? Okay, we have the circuit. We build the circuit. We plug it to the header. Uh, what do we need to write to control the LED? We need this, uh, the RPI GPIO library that we downloaded before. 
and just few lines of code. The first thing we need to do is, I just read it. There are some concepts of Python that we still have to learn fully, but they, they can uh, be easily understood. Uh, let's uh, suppose that we want to turn this LED on and off, making it flash, basically, for 10 seconds, for 10 times better. Um, first thing to do is to tell to the board, get this uh, GPIO ping, and turn it as an output. So we wanted to provide an output, not to, not to read. And to do that, uh, first we need to identify the way we uh, name the pin on the header. And the first line over there, um, let me use the mouse. Here, the, this first line, uh, GPIO set mode, the GPIO board means use the board numbering. You can count the pin starting from the lower row and going up to the upper. And the lower row uh, has only all the numbers, when, uh, whereas the higher row has uh, even numbers of pin starting from left to right. So one, three, five, seven on the low row, two, four, six on the higher row. Um, and that's the GPIO board numbering. And the second line tells, okay, the pin number 15 should be an output, okay? Then what we want to do is to repeat 10 times, light up and turn off the LED. So 10 times in Python is written for i in range 10, that means for i that arranges from zero to 10. What we want to do is to light up the LED so write one, bring the output at the power supply level, okay, at 3.3 volts. That means GPIO output here, number of the pin, 15, level one, logical one. And we get the LED lit. Then we wait for the, a second in that case. So time sleep one means uh, wait a second with the pin at high level, and then the instruction following tell bring the pin at zero, that means to the ground. That results in shutting down the LED. Okay? So, if we go to our development environment and we open uh, this program, okay, okay. This is the program. It's already on the SD card of the GPIO of the Raspberry Pi. I'm remotely connected to the Pi. We will see how to do that, so you can develop from remote. Okay. And now, what we can try to do is to start the script and see if the LED lights up or not. Okay. So if I just write here, um, sudo, that means become a root, the, the root user. And this is needed because for driving the headers, we need to have full power, full privileges on the, on the OS. Um, OK. And let me run another time. Okay, you should see here the LED, which is lit, and okay, now it's finished. I can try it another time. Okay, so you see a long, long design phase in a sense, few, very few lines of code for getting the secret working. So the idea of using Python was driven also by this easiness of working, okay? Just a few lines and you got the circuit working. Okay, so next circuit. If you have any question, just tell me. I, I know that maybe this information is a, a little bit um, overwhelming in a sense, but just tell me if you need uh, any question. Um, okay.
OK, next circuit, a little bit more complex. We, we try to design an output. So let's try to design an input part. We want to detect light. OK? So we have our board, and we want to implement a really, really cheap and simple light sensor. Okay, this is exactly the case for which a commercial device exists, definitely. There are many, lots of uh, light sensors. In the lab, we, we have seen one big sensor that does lighting, humidity, temperature, and whatever. They are more simple. But they have a, a cost, in a sense. They, for example, the one in the lab is around, uh, I think, $60, more or less. Okay? So much more than the, than the board itself, than the PI itself. What if we want, if you just need to detect the, the, the light level, but no more, we don't want to perform any measure, so we don't need any precision. We want just to discriminate between uh, light and not light. We can decide to build our own light sensor and try to read this light level using Python. Uh, what we need is basically to have uh, some component who changes its behavior depending on the light. And the easiest and the simplest component to do that is, is a photoresistor. It's a resistor that changes its resistance value depending on the light. More light, less resistance. Okay? But, but we have a problem. Because the GPIO inputs of the Raspberry Pi are just digital inputs. We can just read logical one or logical zero. And here, what we want to do is to read a value, an analog value, a lighting level. So we need to use a trick. We need to exploit some inner working, working of the logical input to detect the level. In particular, we exploit the fact that there are thresholds identified 1 and 0. In particular, one, any signal in input is identified as a logical one when it goes up a threshold, which for the PI and the TTL 3.3 volts uh, devices is above 2 volts. So any voltage above 2 volts is a logical one. Okay? Any voltage below 0 0.7 volts is a logical zero. OK, good. But we want to detect the light level. How can we measure it? Well, we cannot. We cannot directly measure the light level. But what we can measure is the latency between a zero input and a one input imposed by our circuit. So we can design a circuit that provides, that has a time constant which varies depending on the light. In that case, we can set up the output at zero, so discharge everything, then turn the same pin from output to input and leave the circuit evolve until the voltage that we are measuring reaches the logic one. If we measure this time, and we are able to correlate this, this charging time with the resistor value, we can measure the lighting level. Okay? So the basic idea is to use an RC circuit, which has a time constant, and to measure the time needed for charging the capacitor, basically. And these times depend on the value of the resistor, which is in series with the capacitor, which in turn depends on the light. So this will be the circuit. Okay, let In this case, we don't need to have any consideration about currents, okay? because we are not driving power out. We are just uh, getting something in input. The only thing we need to consider is that, first, the photoresistor have typical values. In this case, the one we use here has a, a value that ranges from 2 to 20 kilo ohms. We cannot change it. it that's it. So we need to design our RC circuit for using that value of resistance. Okay? And the other thing to account is that 
It is true that we don't source any current, but we sink current. We sink current in the moment we put the GPIO input at zero. We said we put it at zero to discharge everything, and then we uh, change it from output to input for reading, for accounting the time that it takes uh, the, uh, to charge the capacitor. When we turn it to zero, we sink current from the capacitor. In that case, we need to protect the input pin because otherwise it may be burnt because the capacitor works like a battery in the transient mode. Okay, so it's like attaching directly 3.3 volts to the pin, okay, without limits. That's why you see that 330 ohms uh, towards the input, only for limiting the discharge current. In this case. The, uh, the rating was 60 milliampers, so we just need to check that 3.3 volts divided uh, 330 ohms is less than 16 milliampers. Okay. Okay. Uh, how can we correlate the lighting level uh, with the time constant of the circuit and the logical one? Actually, we are a very lucky in a sense because. The 2.0 volts, which is the threshold, more or less corresponds to the 63% uh, of the uh, power supply, which is uh, the level reached by an RC circuit at the time constant instant. So after a time constant, the level in output is 63% of the full power supply which correspond more or less to two, two volts. So, roughly, one time constant, logical one. Okay? Changing the time constant changes the time in which we get the one. So it's really easy in a sense. Uh, if you want to compute the time, what, what's the time range uh, for our sensor? For example, our sensor changes from two to 20 kilohms, so, the delay will change from around 2 milliseconds to around 21 milliseconds. Okay? If you want to change the time, we either change the resistor, but remember, since the photosensor is fixed, we can change only the fixed part of the resistance, so we reduce the sensitivity in a sense. The, the range, we reduce the range. On the other hand, we can change the capacitor side. We can grow the capacity or uh, shrink it, and changing that changes the time constant. Uh, two milliseconds, it's already quite low time. So the, the program that will run and count uh, this uh, time instant uh, actually takes a given time for being computed. Uh, every cycle that we will do for counting will take some time. So as low as the constant, as uh, um, less precise is the measurement. So that's why two milliseconds is a reasonable, a reasonable number. Okay, so let's refresh the algorithm and let's, let's try to implement it. Uh, what we said is that we want to discharge the capacitor so that everything is at zero. And to do that, we basically put here a logic zero. We connect to the ground this pin, basically, okay? Then we wait for some time for the capacitor to discharge. And after that, we switch this, input, this uh, pin to input. That means this becomes floating and the circuit charges to the resistors. At some point, the voltage here on the capacitor will reach two volts. At that point, we hand the counting, and we will have a value which depends on the light level. With that value, we can do whatever we want. For example, we can threshold it and decide to light up a lamp or not. OK, Python. We have the circuit. This is a little bit more complex. Now we already know how to drive the LED, because we just uh, explained the, the circuit before. So let's try to write a program that reads the light level, and if the light level is below a given threshold, it lights up the LED. Otherwise, it turns off the LED. 
So, uh, first thing that we need is to prepare a block, a set of instruction that read the lighting level, okay? Uh, and that part here, identified by, you remember, blocks of code are identified by uh, four spaces or one tab, okay? So this one tab space identified this block of instruction. This ensemble is called a function. You will see what a function is and how it is defined on Thursday this week. Okay, so for the moment, take it as, a, as an information I give you, but uh, you will see how. Um, and in this cycle, what we do is to bring the pin at zero, wait a sec, wait a moment, then change the pin to an input and count the time. And here we do it. So, as before, GPL set up the pin that we want to control. This RC pin is basically the number of the pin. We set it up as an output. And immediately afterwards, we put it at the low level, at zero. Then we wait, in this case, for 200 milliseconds. So the number between parentheses in that uh, call and time sleep is in seconds. So 0 0.2 means 200 milliseconds, which is far higher than the time constant, 10 times. Okay? So we are almost sure that the circuit is completely discharged. After that, as we design it in our algorithm, we turn the pin from the output function to the input function. So you got, uh, we got this GPIO set up, the same pin GPIO in. We get the time. So the, this start equal time dot time means take the current time and then start, ta start counting until the port is at the low level. Okay? So here we start cycling and summing one. One plus one plus one plus one plus one until the logical level on the port raises above uh, the 2.0 voltage, so it becomes one. At that point, we stop cycling and we got the number. This number is almost related with the lighting level. We don't care about the number because, for example, here we want just to check. Uh, it's not completely true, but let's say we not only care about the number, we also want to measure the, the actual time passed, so we want to get the time on milliseconds. And that's why here we just print, for example, time dot time, so the same call as before, the current time minus the time that we took before starting the cycle. In that way, we got the time of the milliseconds that passed from uh, when we turn the, the, the pin to an input mode uh, up to uh, the time in which the pin uh, gets a, a, an high level input. Afterwards, this last line provides back the count. Okay? How many cycles we performed. Using this count, we can threshold the count and decide that above a given threshold, we light up or we turn off the LED. In particular, we know that <coughs> the resistance decreases with the higher amounts of light, so the count will decrease with higher amounts of light. So we, if we threshold this count value, when the count value will be lower than a given selected value, for example, 1,000, then we turn the LED off because the light is intense in some way, on the other hand, if the count is higher than the, the threshold, we can turn the LED on. Okay? More or less clear? So let's try it. So here you have the same uh, project. And if I go here and I do launch the light script. Okay, here you got the time measured. At this moment, we are measuring around 18 milliseconds of charging time, okay, continuously. 
with the repeats. And if we switch to the circuit view, we get the LED lit. So the light is low, the LED is lighted up. Now, if I turn on torch on my cellular phone to illuminate the resistor, so here we have the resistor, this component here. Let me try to. OK. It is this one. The, the black one is the capacitor, and the one just on the, on the left, uh, it's the resistor, OK? And if I try to illuminate it with the torch, you see the LED turns off. And if I remove the torch, and if I move it slowly, we can get the level, OK? So with this circuit, which costs uh, around, uh, I think, less than a euro, much less than a euro, we got a light switch. And that's why, in this case, we may consider to develop it instead of using one which is available as a commercial tool, because actually we spend much less than the other. OK. OK, uh, last circuit, very, very quick, because we are running late. And in a sense, easier. Uh, we light up the LEDs using, uh, let me switch. OK. Oh, you saw here that the LED is still, is still lit, because I stopped the program. And when I stopped the program, the GPIO output was set at 1. And it will get. We will stay in that state until we reset it. Okay? So in this case, it will be lit until the next program will set it at zero. So one other thing to count is to uh, reset all the inputs and outputs when needed, especially when we are developing. Okay. So to do that, we can just run it another time. And for example, if I run the old program, it will just uh, blink and stop at a zero. Okay. Okay. In the meanwhile, third project, we read the light. What about reading a button? So we want to have a button to push. For example, because we need it for uh, some operation of the PI. If you want to, I don't know, use the PI for uh, uh, managing a Z-wave network, we will need at some point to associate devices. To do that, usually uh, people press a button. But if we are using the PI, we don't have buttons. So maybe we want to provide a button to act physically on the, on the, on the device. In that case, Let's suppose for this moment to join our first experiment with this last, and we try to push a button for lighting up the LED. So we read the input from, uh, from the button, and using this input, we drive the LED. So we need the same components for lighting that we used for lighting the LED, plus a button, a couple of resistors, and a capacitor. OK, why we need the capacitor? Because unfortunately, the buttons are mechanical elements. And even if we don't notice it, because it's really quick, when we press the button, actually there are two contacts that uh, go together and uh, make electrical contact between them. But these contacts are uh, connected to a kind of spring. Okay? They, they behave like a spring. So what happens is that actually when we press the button, the two contacts bounce for a while. Very quick, less than a few milliseconds, but they bounce. And if we directly attach the button to the input, the input is so quick that we get one zero, one zero, one zero, one zero, one zero, very quick. But what we want is just pressed one, unpressed zero. We don't care about the bounces. So what we need is to 
build a, a so-called debounce circuit, something that isolates these bounces from the input. And how can we do that? Basically, using an RC circuit. With this RC uh, circuit, we introduce a, a time constant, so we prevent the voltage to go over the threshold in the time in which the button bounces, basically. And the circuit is there, it's just a resistor and a capacitor, and what the button does is to short circuit the capacitor, okay? So when we press the, bot uh, the button, the voltage drops instantaneously at zero, and when the button bounces, the capacitor starts to load, to charge, okay? But it has a, const a time constant. So if the button bounces, it starts uh, several times, but it takes uh, at least one RC time, as we already know, to reach the logical one. So we are isolating the bounces, okay? And for computing how, for how much for a time we are able to isolate the, bounce, uh, the bounces, we can just compute the time constant. In our case, for these components, for example, it's around five milliseconds. So for five milliseconds, we are ignoring the bounces of the button Afterwards, we will get one or zero. This circuit works uh, in an inverse manner. Ma uh, manner. That means um, when we press the button, we get zero instead of one. Okay. So to detect the button pressure, we need to detect the zero, the logic zero, not the logic one. Okay. So when we write the program, we simply detect zero instead of one. Okay. Let's go to the program. Uh, same as before, so we set the numbering mode at the board, one. We have also here um, a function that takes uh, the number of the ping. And first, we set the GPIO ping from which we want to read the button as an input. Because in this case, it's just an input. On the other hand, uh, we want to set up the pin that we use to drive the LED as an output. Then we start a cycle for reading the level on the input pin, and when we detect that the level is a logical zero, this equal to false means logical zero, then we turn on the LED. Okay. Because we remember that logical zero means button pressed. When we release the button, the logical level raises until one, and the logical output will be low, okay, here, in this else condition. So with this program, we just detect the button pressure. So uh, let's try to run it. Um, Okay, and I'll switch to the board. Okay, at this point the LED is off, and in theory when we press the button, the green button, we get the, red, the LED on. Okay, we can go as quick as we want, because actually the isolation time is just five milliseconds, absolutely far down what we can reach uh, even by pressing as fast as we can. Okay? We switch uh, in times which are uh, around uh, one tenth of seconds. No more faster. Okay? So that's why it works. Okay. Okay, and for today it's all. And if you have any question, you can just ask now, in the future, no problem. Okay? Take your time to digest everything and...